everyone. Um, my name is Carmen Bogan, and I want to just welcome you to our year in celebration, the journey to the vision. I know that all of you have, each of us has had an experience that we thought would break us into pieces and that we would never be able to function again. But all praise to God. It was just the beginning of a journey. There's a saying in the church world that says, too blessed to be stressed. And I heard another saying, and I thought of my daughter because my daughter is, is really in the throes right now of her career. And the saying that I heard was stressed to be blessed. And I really believe that the stress that we have been through many times makes us so stronger and is just the beginning of the journey. And so thank you all for joining us. Next slide. Um, just want to do a little bit of education about Zoom. Not that you all need any education about Zoom because we have been Zooming now for a very long time, too long. But this is how you change your Zoom name. You hover over the video, you click the three dots in the upper right corner, you click rename and you change your name to whatever you want it to be. Tootsie Sweets, whatever floats your boat. A little bit of housekeeping, turn your video on by clicking the video icon at the bottom, mute your line, by clicking the microphone icon, you all know that. Use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen to make a comment or ask for technical assistance. And Shai is there, Shai will help you with that. You can toggle between gallery view, speaker view. If you wanna take it off of full screen, you can do that as well um, by looking at those dots at the top. Hide non-video participants by clicking on the three dots. Um, and when we take a short break, stay logged in. We don't want you to have a problem getting back in, so stay logged in. But please mute your audio when you're feeding your dog. We don't need to know that. And turn off your camera. Next, please. We're going to have a $50 gift card giveaway, and we're going to be asking a couple of questions. They're really fun questions. And while Shai said that the answer was obvious, I didn't think so, um, but they're fun questions. Anyway, and you're going to get that. I just wanna uh, introduce the Model Built on Faith team. Sandra Alexander, who is the amazing executive director of Occur. You can see her there at the top. If you see all of the participants, she likes to be behind the scenes. Um, we're going to skip me and go to Michelle Miles Chambers, who's a senior program officer for Faith. Michelle, I have known Michelle for so long, and she started out as this just little girl. And now she is a grown woman, honey. She is a grown woman, and she is here. You're going to hear from her. You're going to hear just a teeny bit about her journey as well. So Ron Stokes, who is Michelle's amazing, wonderful program assistant. Ebony Smith, you know Ebony by now, uh, beautiful program assistant for Faiths, Denise DeLuca, um, outreach specialist for Occur, Shai Alderman, our operations manager, amazing, and Simone Stokes. This is the amazing A Model Built on Faith team, 2022. And we'll skip this one. I'm Carmen Bogan. And I am a development consultant and I have been the program director for A Model Built on Faith for some time. And I'm also the co-founder of this program with David Glover, whom we lost years ago. Shai Alderman, you can change this slide. I don't like sitting here looking at myself. <laughs> That's a little strange. Michelle had some things to say. Are we time. stuck? Oh, are we? <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't like to look at Are we own. stuck on my slide? Okay. 
the next person who's going to speak <clears throat> is Michelle Miles Chambers. And we all know Michelle Miles Chambers. She's the senior program officer. Hi, Cynthia. She's the senior program officer uh, for uh, at the San Francisco Foundation. And she heads up a model built on faith. And she is doing an extraordinary job on that. Um, Michelle, I'd like to know if you can just take, you know, a few minutes and tell us a little bit about, if you don't mind, uh, how you started um, working on faiths and just a little bit about that. And then also a little bit about the victory that we have with Ken. Uh, her husband, Ken. And the reason I ask about Ken is because that we want this, as Steve Holly has said, to be inspirational to you all too. We know that, that we all go through some difficult times, but we don't land there. We, I mean, land there, but we don't build our home there. And Michelle Miles Chambers is one of the strongest women of faith that I know. A lot of people talk about faith, but when it comes to active faith, um, look at Michelle. Uh, so it is it is my great honor to introduce you to some and to present to others. Uh, First Lady, Dr. Soon, um, Michelle Miles Chambers. Are you there, Michelle? I know she's there. She might've clicked out. She'll come back in. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so Michelle, I think she had a technical problem, but I need to tell you a little bit about this organization while she's getting back up to speed. Um, the theme for OCUR, many of you may not know this, but the theme for OCUR is creating communities of opportunity. This is the perfect theme for OCUR. And Shai, please let me know when Michelle comes back in because we could take a break from the history. But I want you all to know a little bit about OCUR because you know of OCUR, but you may not know about OCUR. And um, it is a rich story. And it truly is a story about Ooh. creating. You there? Oh, I heard something. She's not there. Anyway, but I but but I wanted I want to tell you just a little bit about Occur. And for those of you, um, raise your hand if you have known about Occur for ten years or more. Okay. So Occur from 1954 to 1964, Occur was founded to confront critical challenges facing local government on housing resources, urban renewal, population growth, and desegregation. Desegregation in Oakland. Occur begins to advise city leaders on these issues. From 1964 to 1974, Occur addresses civil rights and social justice issues of housing discrimination, local employment, and federal program decision-making. OCUR designs the first community development district leadership structure. 1974 to 1984, OCUR begins to fight for neighborhood resident leadership to challenge displacement by freeway construction and other major development projects. Occur demands that neighborhoods have input into critical planning decisions that relate to jobs and contracting opportunities. And I believe that this is the first time that we heard the, the term, nothing about us without us. 1984-94, Occur proposes a community and minority equity participation policy and emphasizes the importance of neighborhood empowerment and expanding the local community development agenda. OCUR educates thousands of nonprofit organizations on capacity building and organization development. And this is when the whole idea 
of the work that we do now actually started. 94 to 2004, OCCUR develops asset mapping, needs assessments, and neighborhood profiles. You all remember those neighborhood profiles? Uh, it was a lot of work. David brought me in to help work on that, and those were a lot of work. OCCUR launches community technology by establishing, wait for it, the Eastmont Computing Center. Remember that? as a multimedia learning center for digital inclusion before everybody was talking about digital divides and digital inclusion. That started over there at the Eastmont Computing Center. Occur utilizes community technology and new content creation along with consumer demand to increase investment in emerging communities. 2004, 2014. Michelle's back. And right after this, Michelle, we want to hear from you. Occur continues to revitalize low to moderate income neighborhoods and communities by facilitating strategic local investments and development activity along key retail and commercial corridors by following up with banks. Remember all that work with community bank of the bank, social investors and foundations like the San Francisco Foundation. Occur aggressively implements financial literacy and commuter edu community education programs, that's consumer education programs, Carmen, for low-income residents and families toward the promotion of more sustainable community economy. Comor co Occur engages faith-based institutions alongside community-based and nonprofit organizations. And this is when we started doing the work with a model built on faith. And this was also the time when um, David, I had another name for this organization. It was the core program because the idea was it strengthened the core of our, our faith-based nonprofit communities. And David looked me straight in the eye and said, no, this is going to be called a model built on faith. And it has been the model built on faith since then, because once David passed and Sandra and I we're working so hard to keep things going. What did we do, Sandra? We prayed on the phone. We did. We worked constantly. Away. Didn't we pray? Lots of prayer. Lots we, of prayer. Had, we had so much prayer. And, and we just made sure that we kept um, our God lifted up. And the scripture that says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added. So when you're looking at what we have now, where we have been, and and because this is a faith program, and that's my faith, I have no problem sharing it with all of you. Uh, so there. <laughs> and I just want to add, and God answered the prayers, as you all can see, we're still here. We're still here. And even when we thought we walked away, we're still here. <laughs> Another great thing happened. Another great thing happened. And that was during this time, Occur built on that success for the David E. Glover Education and Tech Technology Center. And it's the Tech U program filled with innovation, innovative commuter coding, robotic pro uh, projects, and STEM, which is math, English, literally, and STEAM, which, which includes art. You can see all of this artwork in the background. You'd be surprised. Ta-da, those are my paintings. I think a lot of people would be surprised and children will be surprised at what they can do if they're encouraged to do it. And even old people like me can do amazing things. So this is about encouragement. You may look at your program today and you may say the program today and you may say, well, that's wonderful for them, but what about me? Um, that this is the, you know, it's been really difficult for us during the pandemic, but this is the beginning of the journey. And I am not a preacher, but I got to say one thing. What do you think the children of Israel thought the beginning of their journey out of Egypt? And where did that land? Okay. 2014 to current. Occur implements empowerment programs that address consumer awareness issues, higher learning opportunities and entrepreneurial development. Occur ensures that low to moderate income families can access the infinite potential of digital innovation 
to participate in technology and a te technology driven economy. It continues to engage faith and community based organizations because we're in this together to achieve optimal community impact through critical capacity building training and cultivating collaborative partnerships. Occur executes education initiatives that address financial challenges and regional housing and displacement issues. And so here we are with our crit a critical capacity building. And some of the people that we're talking to today were there with us, like some of the people like, um, in particular, uh, Dee Johnson, Betty Blackmore G, and others who started out trying to figure out how just to write proposals. And then when you see what has happened with Dee's program and her 25th, don't you cry, Dee. <laughs> when you see and Dr. Nadine Scott, the things that she has done um, when she was just beginning to learn to write proposals and came to our initial workshops, you got, um, you go see something, okay? So I just like to hear a minute, just a second from Michelle. Michelle, are you in? I'm, I'm in, yeah, my just, computer Can you is please so just up. say hello to everybody? Of course, of course. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to see you guys this morning. I have been away um, taking care of my dear husband of, is it 36 or 37 years? Anyway, it's been a long time, y'all. When we was, I didn't have no wrinkles. I didn't have to color my hair when I first met him and all the other stuff that goes on with that. Um. So I'm so excited to see you guys. I just want to thank you guys for supporting uh, a model built on faith all of these years. And I actually, before I go into my accolades, I want to put a challenge out to you guys. You all have to share this resource with others, with your colleagues, with your family members, with your business partners, because we're going to be starting a new session and we need folks to come and participate and share in the learnings. There's so much information. There's so many resources. There's so many tentacles that we can connect to people. You guys just heard Carmen say some things, but I want to give a big shout out to the OCUR staff um, and Carmen and everyone that's part of that and all of our presenters throughout the year. It has just, this has just been so phenomenal. I always enjoy this partnership. We're family. It's not a partnership, but we're family. And, you know, when folks can, you can call folks at any time of the night or text them and they respond, that is a good thing, even if it's, if it's personal or if it's business. So, a shout out to occur for holding a model built on faith down all of these years from the concept of it being a concept to it being a program and moving through and really expanding. So we're so excited about that. I want to uh, give a shout out to our CEO, Fred Blackwell, who's going to join us a little later and our San Francisco Foundation staff for really supporting the faiths program with this um, family affair that we call the model built on faith and just providing the continued resources for this wonderful partnership. Um, I cannot forget my soul sister of faith, which is a Saran who holds me down. And I wanna thank her for just keeping me on the train track, y'all, on the right train, because sometimes I'd be trying to get on the wrong BART train, y'all. So I wanna just thank her. Um, and I wanna thank the That's presenters. That's true. Yes. <laughs> I want to thank the presenters here today and the um, and the moderator, um, such great individuals, such great women that I know personally, and they just have uh, pouring out of their heart to be in community and share with community. So you're in for, we're in for a great opportunity. After this, I'm going to go on my phone because again, my computer is having some issues. And I just want to give a praise report. I'm a Christian by uh, faith. And my husband, some of you all know, my husband was dealing with kidney cancer and he had to have both of his kidneys removed and a transplant. God has blessed that that surgery has been very successful. My daughter was the recipient. And so I was caring for two precious cargo family members at the same time. But God is so good. Oh, there he is. Praise the Lord. Hi, God. God is good. 
so we are so blessed because I knew that I had an expanded community of faith and interfaith leaders that was sending up prayers for me, sending up hope. And so I just want to thank you guys. I felt your presence and I really, really appreciate it. So I am back in the saddle um, and I want you guys to be back in the saddle with me. And this is a, a year in celebration, but we also have to plan for the new year that's coming. And guess what? I'm challenging everybody. You guys have to invite 10 people to the new session, which means about five people are gonna show up. All right, I'm gonna invite five new people too, so that we can make this a great year that's coming up for our a model built on faith. Thank you all so much. Continued blessings um, and grace for everyone. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Carmen, Sandra, Ebony, Shai, Simone, everyone. And Denise, Denise is still there, girl, go girl. Thank you guys so much for your, your support and the opportunity to partner on this great program. Thank you. Thank you. We give you a shout out. <laughs> precious, precious woman. We're going we're gonna, to uh, uh, do something right now. We're going to, Dee, I want you to unmute yourself and be ready because you're going to hear from Dee Johnson. Dee Johnson is the executive director of the Linda Hand Foundation. Let me just tell you a little bit about her. Dee Johnson, whose experience with youth includes being a devoted parent, a former foster parent for nine years, community volunteer and a mentor. She founded the Linda Hand Foundation in 1997. The organization started with few funds and sometimes no funds. The first mission of love provided over 100 youth at the Henry Robinson Multiservice Center with Easter baskets that she and other volunteers prepared. The team dug deep into their own pockets, as well as holding fish fries and raffles and other fundraising activities to provide services to underserved children, youth, and families with a special focus on transitional housing and facilities, shelters, and foster care. Today, the organization has grown to a seven member board with nine advisory board members, a team of ambassadors, youth advisory committee, and other community um, partners. Now in its 25th year of giving, Dee has spearheaded a successful annual back to school giveaway and other programs. This past August, Linda Hand Foundation celebrated the 23rd annual mm -hmm. supply distribution, providing 25,000 students with their educational tools. To date, the organization has provided over 133,000 supply kits since the program began in 1999. Dee is now working on other initiatives to help bridge the gap to make sure families have their needs met. Dee has received several recognitions, including the Jefferson Award. She received an honorable discharge, get this, from the United States Coast Guard Reserves, who knew that? And wrote a book, which I purchased, and I, I really recommend it, and it's called Facing the Nonprofit Blues, Turning Life's Challenges into Life's Joy. She has developed online magazines and the beat goes on is the name of that magazine, focusing on unsung community leaders. She's a lifelong learner. She recently attended and completed the Stanford Institute of Philanthropy Fundraising Academy. And she is now working to continue to expand her knowledge. And why does she want to do this? She says, to be of, of better service. So I just want to introduce you to, before I, before I bring on Dee, I want to show you a story that was recently done on her um, with CBS. And Sha, I'd like to ask you to begin that presentation now.
I can't hear it. Shy. You can't hear it. Okay. Can anyone hear it? Can't we can't hear it, Shy? Shy, you may have to unmute yourself. He gave me a hug. She's not a teacher or school administrator. In fact, she's usually not even on campus, but she gets ready for back to school all year long. Sharon Chen on the open woman known for giving back on the first day of school. He gave me a hug. Thank you. Embassy. Smiling children receive free backpacks with the school supplies they need. Some crayons and erasers and sharpeners and pencils. At Martin Luther King Jr. Elementary School in Oakland. Thank you for all the stuff of the school. It's a priceless picture. You're so welcome, it's our pleasure. We wanna make sure that you have all the tools that you need. And dream fulfilled. Let me give you a backpack. For Dee Johnson. It's got plenty of tools in there for you. Dee has given away more than 133,000 backpacks. But you can have more. To low public school children in Oakland and Alameda oh, County. I got some slip cards in my birthday at school. In the last quarter century. It's just unbelievable. The foster mother co-founded the Lend a Hand Foundation in 1997. In 1996, I developed lung cancer. So I survived. And obviously for me, it meant um, my work was not done. I was something else I needed to do. Lend a Hand grew. Thank you for from distributing 200 free backpacks in 1997 to almost 10,000 last year. Awesome. And this fall, we needed a hand. We needed some hands for sure. Our volunteers are helping to pack a whopping 25,000 backpacks for its 25th anniversary of equipping underserved kids for learning. Having those tools will build confidence will allow you to know that, you know, you're just as important as others and you can also succeed. We have nine stations. Dee doesn't just extend a hand in school readiness. Okay. Uh, she's given tens of thousands of food bags during COVID. You guys okay over here? You need anything? Scholarships and life skills workshops. It's that connection. That's what it's all about, connection. And the holiday wishes she fulfills are an eye-opening window on poverty. So it just really touches your heart, the, the, the story last year when we were at the Coliseum and a child said they wanted a blanket. It didn't have a blanket. And when her heart is heavy. I lost my mom in 2017. Dee reaches for her light. We were both diagnosed with breast cancer at the same time. And even though she was going through that, she just told me to keep on fighting and keep on doing what I'm doing. Bless your heart. Thank you so much. And her perseverance. Wonderful. Has paid off. Money wasn't always available, but for some reason, and I believe that's all by the grace of God. Isn't it beautiful? Something happened. A door was open, even though a door was closed. Doors keep opening. The same backpack for the same supply. As the need grows, sponsors step up. Oh, that too. With more support, she can keep dreaming. I wish that Linda Hand could build some tiny houses. I wish that, you know, we had this big warehouse where families could just come on a regular basis and get what they need. Thank you so much. So that's so what much. it means to me. Enjoy. She'll keep lending a hand. So don't forget, let us know what else you might need to bring smiles beyond backpacks. In Oakland, Sharon Chin, KPIX 5. To keep our customers safe. Wow. <laughs> e. Johnson. This is all, this, this, this is we all. lift you up. Mm. Thank and you so, so now, much. <laughs> I'm going to have a, 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 a conversation with Dee Johnson. Um, because I think what's important is not that we just look at the accomplishments, but we hear a little bit about the journey um, that brought you there. And, and Dee, I don't know where you want to start in talking about this because this is your story. But I remember when I was reading your book that I was amazed that even your starting this journey started out of your own despair. And the way 
that you responded to despair was to start distributing grace, the grace that you had been given to survive to other people. Can you talk a little bit about that? Hmm. That's, a, that's hard. It's, it's really hard to even talk about, you know, what we've done all these years to support others. My mom and my grandmother instilled in me at a very early age that no matter how little we had, that we should still help others. And I witnessed some really trying times. I even remember a lady dropping off her baby for my grandmother to take care of. And just for a few hours, and that baby ended up being there for weeks and how my grandmother just loved, just all of a sudden just start loving on this child and making sure that the child was countable. And every day saying, I really hate to have to call CPS, um, but I'm gonna have to do that. But it was just so hard just watching my grandmother, listening to her and saying, we have to help uh, no matter what's going on, keep your faith keep praying, keep trusting. Things are gonna happen, but you just gotta keep that faith. Um, the despair of just a lot of stuff that happened that I witnessed um, in life with my siblings, my mom, didn't stop me from pushing forward. My mom always said, no matter how tough it gets, just keep, your faith, keep trusting in the Lord. He will, she would say, just hold on soldier. I remember her saying that over and over again. Hold on soldier. When I would think, oh my God, why am I, why do I continue to do this when things keep, you know, happening? People are saying, oh, they just give out backpacks. Oh, they're, they're nobody. Uh, what they're doing is nothing. Or oh, anybody can give out a backpack or anybody. But those things are so very important yes. to a child. Let me ask um, you a question, D, not to interrupt you, but I want to ask you, what, what was the thing that um, made you turn a corner? How did you pick yourself up and say, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to I'm going to transition from a warrior to a warrior. And I'm just going to steal my back. And I'm going to, I'm going to do this. What, what happened? What did you, what did you hold on to? What did you, what, what made you move from one arena to the arena and the, the D that we see now? Well, when I got lung cancer and I survived and the odds were all against me to not survive, wow, that was a turnaround time right there. All those things that I was thinking I was supposed to be doing or I was going to do or was in my mind to do, I said, you know what? I have been a foster parent for nine years. I have gotten lung cancer. The Lord has left me here for a reason. So I have to continue this work I'm doing to help our children. So that's when I said, you know what? Let me get out here and see what's going on in the world, see how I can help even more. So that turned me around. Okay. Surviving we've, cancer is no seen, joke. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we've, we've seen your your success thus far this is your 25th anniversary i remember when we started out with just learning how to write proposals and now you're there you have sponsors you're moving forward your organization is successful and it's going to be more successful the last thing I want to ask you is, if you can just give me 
a word of encouragement for those executive directors, because let me say, being an executive director is one of the most, or a pastor, leader in doing this work from the, the book of Isaiah chapter 58, when you all have a chance to look at it. This is the fast that God is asking us for. And so can you give, what would you say the way your mom said to you, what would you say to these pastors who've been through COVID, seeing congregations lost, members lost, buildings lost, um, nonprofit organizations having difficulty with funds, but the work, like the work that our Angelique Page is talking about. Angelique is working with children who are waiting for kidneys, for example. Can you give us just very briefly, a word of encouragement and advice. Oh. Staying focused on the vision and making sure that you do everything that you can, collaborating with others. I believe that's the way in which we're gonna be able to turn all these things around for us to mobilize and to get things done and just not give up and just keep on and depending and trusting in the Lord so that you can, we can see a change. I would really like to see a change. I would like to see our families off the streets. I wish that we could get a big building and bring as many families in as we possibly can. So whatever our vision, we just gotta keep on fighting, keep on pushing, whatever it is, the laws, whatever, and just come together. And don't to give make, up. And don't give up. What about, and, and would you include also lifelong learning? Because we oh, yes, want to make have sure to. that everybody yes. has the capacity. Absolutely. The capacity. Out. I remember when I first started, I had no idea that it was going to be as hard as it was to give somebody something. I thought, what's why can't I just go give somebody something? And I found out that I couldn't just do it that way. I, I was with all this passion. I, what about, I needed to know how to do it, how to meet with people, who to talk to, what the laws and the rules and et cetera were. So it was very heartening for me to want to give a family some diapers or give them some money when we were working at the Amy Robinson. So um, learning and coming to occur, and I had no idea, and you taught me so much. Thank you, uh, Carmen. So everybody Kurt, in the program. Sandra, and everybody, everybody, everybody in the program taught me so much. And, and I continue, and I will continue yes, to please. learn as much as I possibly can. Yes. And you will be presenting as well. And you're yep. presenting now. <laughs> and there are people who are starting out who are listening to you. And... We could spend all day talking about what you've done, right. but but I want to just let you know that everybody here is celebrating you, and we want to thank you, D. Johnson, Executive Director, Warrior, and Women of God of the Linda Hand Foundation. Thank you for joining us and sharing your journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we have Dr. Nadine Scott. Dr. Nadine D. Scott has been serving the community for the past 40 years. She is the co-founder and executive director of Aerial Outreach Mission, which is an organization that provides shelter, food, clothing, shoes, life and work, essential skills, resume development, employment, leads, advocacy, counseling, and other social supportive services to those in need. Nadine later assisted in establishing Help You Now Services and Grants, Inc. She has a 501c3 organization, which is called Aerial Outreach Mission. Dr. Scott has been very instrumental in helping organizations and individuals to get on track. Uh, with whatever their challenges happen to be. And might I add, one of the loveliest people you would ever meet. Please join me in 
in welcoming Dr. Nadine Scott. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Carmen and the whole staff of OCUR for having me here today. It's my pleasure to be with you. And thank you for the invitation. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we okay. hear you. Wonderful. Um, you see a picture here that says the aerial team and others. Um, I just want to, uh, you said it, Carmen, but I just want to clarify that it's two of us. Uh, my sister is the founder and CEO. I'm the co-founder. We've been together for 40 years. So I just want to clear that up. Um, and that's part of our team there. And uh, you can go to the next one. And it's all about caring and partnerships. We were presented last year uh, with a grant award from Lowe's and they are building a, an auxiliary dwelling unit uh, on our residential shelter. And they teamed up with HGTV and uh, they gave my husband and I a surprise renovation. And uh, some of you may have seen the show. Next. This is uh, a part of our uh, Alameda Food Bank team. Uh, Carmen in the red shirt, Wanda in the black jacket, and the other two guys were assisting us that day. Um, we are partners with the Alameda County Community Food Bank. Next. Uh, this is one of our uh, street giveaways. Uh, not only do we, we uh, do uh, deliveries for seniors, for elders, for those that are disabled. Uh, but we also uh, go out on the streets of East Oakland and we provide uh, hot meals for those in the area. Sheriff Department Partnership. Next. School support, as uh, Sister D was talking about backpacks. We uh, help with about two, two to 3,000 backpacks uh, per uh, uh, when the children return back to school. So that's uh, one of our things that we love to do. Next, Christmas for families. So we're doing over 2,500 families with toys um, each Christmas and meals. So we make sure they get Christmas meals also. Next, beautiful family there. So this is one of the groups uh, that helps with uh, the uh, toy giveaways for Christmas. And they come in to bless children at two of our uh, facilities. So this was one of the facilities that they uh, came to on that day. Next. And this is a part of the Christmas giveaway with the parlor from Alameda, California. And then here's two of our, our beautiful families um, that have been assisted. And uh, we are uh, over uh, 200, almost 300,000 women that we have been able to assist over the years, over the past 40 years. And these are just some of the, some small slides. Uh, that we have uh, before you here, some pictures of some of the mothers and their children. We do single women and single women with children, but we are placing not only women, but also men all day long because we uh, help the 211 hotline. And uh, Dr. Carla Jackson is one that mans that hotline uh, as if it was her own. So she's taking about 70 to 80 calls a day, uh, trying to help place men, women, and children. Next. These are some of our supporters. Um, and it didn't you know, start out like this at the beginning, but as time goes on, you will develop relationships with different people from different organizations. And um, 
I am very grateful for all of those who have uh, been helping us through the years and uh, occur and San Francisco Foundation, Safeway Foundation, Macy's, the Lowell Berry Foundation, who has been a, such a great organization to us. And I believe some are online today. Black Firefighters Association, so many. Local 55, Enterprise Rent a Car, uh, Albertson. You can see Toys for Tots. The San Francisco Foundation has been such a great blessing to us in Western Digital and CRS Rice Bowl. Uh, next. I'm probably at the end. And that's the last slide. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much. You. Uh, I, I'm interested in, in hearing a, a little bit more because there's so much that you do that it's hard sometimes to get our arms around exactly how you define your services. So when you are, are talking to the community and, you, and people say, what, what do you help with? What can you help me with? What do you say to them? Well, I have to point out that this all came from our parents, uh, Pastor and Mrs. Hines in Bakersfield, California. There's a house on the corner of Six and P. And in, at that house, we had seven biological children and three adopted. But let me tell you, everybody knew that they could come to Six and P Street uh, and get a meal, diapers, uh, furniture, uh, groceries to send with you, whatever it is, from A to Z, my parents were there and they're still there on that corner, still doing the same thing, shelter and all. Wow. So that got into our spirit. Uh, and when I came here to the Bay Area to go to San Francisco State, I saw young ladies at school that did not even have a place to stay. Wow. And I had plenty of room. And I said, you know what, Lord, mm -hmm. give me the opportunity. I want to start taking some women, uh, uh, some college students in. And that's when it started. Wow. 1982, taking in college students. And wow. from there, it grew. So we do life skills, uh, shelter, uh, case management. Uh, we help victims of crime. We have a place for those involved with domestic violence job training, uh, resume writing, work essential skills, you name it. We help people to get on uh, jobs through our partnerships. Some of the people can go on to, to work that same day. Uh, wardrobe assistance, GED programs, uh, daycare, uh, fitness and health, uh, eye care, dental, access to health care. So, so many wraparound services we try to provide uh, to be a one-stop shop. Wow. You know, the, the, if, if I were to say the one thing that I have found difficult in, in asking you questions is that you are so humble that I have to really target my question to get at the core of all the many amazing things you do, because for you, it's, it's, just what you do. And, and even more so, it's just who you are. Uh, now, the last question I want to ask you is that there are a lot of people who are, well, first of all, there are a lot of people who are celebrating you today. I even, I think I saw a couple of foundations who are here. I know Low Berry is represented here um, in our audience. Hey, lift it up for Low Berry. <laughs> Um, but I remember when you as well were starting to write proposals, mm -hmm. you went through those proposals and we came back and, and, and now you have learned how to do this and learn how to form partnerships mm -hmm. in such a way. And this is a, a thing that we hear today is that get your partnerships together, get your partnerships together. Um, um, figure out who it is that you can work with to do all of these services. So if I were to ask you to encourage some of these small nonprofits and pastors and churches who are trying to do work, maybe not immediately on the scale of yours, what would you say 
by way of encouragement and wise instruction for where to start. So like uh, Sister D, we started out with pretty much not very much, just what was in our pockets, my sister and I, and um, we did what we can with that, what, whatever we had. So um, when you are trying to build your nonprofit, uh, I, my advice would be make sure all of your paperwork is intact and, uh, and in line because uh, you wanna be able to apply for grants because that's one of, go is one of the ways it's gonna help sustain you. Also help from your family members, your friends, your doctor's office, your dentist's office and whatnot. You have some help right there in your community. Um, and one thing, uh, Carmen, that I really appreciate is how Occur and San Francisco Foundation has wrapped their arms around us and taught us uh, different things as far as writing grants and, and how we could you know, formulate this and do that. Uh, and the Lowberry Foundation uh, has been such a great blessing. You all have given us one-on-one -on -one instruction. You've given us group instruction. And that's vital when you're trying to build your organization. And when you are an executive director or uh, whatever your position might be, learn how to write grants because that's gonna be your bread and butter. Um, and some people tell me sometimes, I, I wrote this grant and I got denied. I wrote another one, maybe 10 denials. But the thing that I teach is never give up. I too, when I started writing grants years ago, uh, almost 25 years ago, I got denials. But you know what? You shake the dust off and you write another one. And right now for our organization, I write at least 40 or 50 grants per year. And at least half of those are awarded. So you have to put as many irons in the fire that you can. And um, uh, uh, if there's anything that I, I can ever do to help you, I'm willing. And uh, you can reach out to me at any time. Someone helped me and my sister and our organization when we needed help. And uh, we are so grateful. I see some of the, the supporters right now in the meeting on today. So uh, the Bates and Pauline Williams and so many others, C. Oates, Claudia Oates, they are individual supporters. And then we have organizations that are on our side no matter what. I tell you, they're, they're with you. Once you get your, hand, uh, your foot in that door, you have some organizations that will stick with you for life. And so we have organizations that have been with us for 20, 25 years supporting our organization each year. So don't never give up. That's the key. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So as as there's an old mother in my in my church and now I'm the old mother in the church. And um <laughs> and, and I, I have to say what she said, y'all gonna make me cry. <laughs> because this is real and, and this is the best advice anyone could ever give you. I particularly um, really think that it's, it's amazing that you say, you know, I write 40 grants. I write proposals myself, uh, 40 every year. And, and my thing is for all of you who are, are listening to this, it's important that you write 40 and then you have your staff to come to the trainings. Mm -hmm. And they write 40. Right. And that means that if you got 50%, you got 40 grants that just came in for you, that mm -hmm. you won. So wise, wisdom, that's the thing. Thank you so much. Can You're you so all welcome. join me in celebrating our wonderful Dr. Nadine Scott and her sister, Dr. Carla Jackson. Dr. Carla. Thank you, Dr. Carla. Thank you, sister. We're Bye -bye. a good team. Next, you know her name. You, may, you know the name of her son, Oscar Grant. And, and you know that the story, a little bit of the story behind the Oscar Grant Foundation.
But let me tell you a little bit about the woman, Wanda Johnson. Reverend Wanda Johnson has become an amplified voice of empathy and compassion for individuals seeking justice, grieving, and healing from innocent lost lives by hands of law enforcement. Her beloved only son, Oscar Grant III, was murdered by an Oakland BART transit officer on January 1st, 2009. If you live in Oakland, the story is not new to you. Her experience around the justice process, the media and legalities around trial, strategy and community work has become a key role nationally as she travels the world seeking justice for our communities worldwide. She works with mothers like the mother of Mike Brown, Eric Garner, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice and countless other families across the country. Wanda currently has a documentary that premiered at the San Francisco, <clears throat> excuse me, film festival in 2022. Find it and watch it. It's called Black Mothers Love and Resist. Wanda has appeared on Beyonce's special visual album, Lemonade featuring some of all of those mothers, or I should say all of those mothers. The Oscar Grant tragedy was a reawakening of taking an action for justice. Oakland's demand for justice ignited a national movement demanding justice in all similar cases. Such publicity caught the attention of Forrest Whitaker. In 2013, he produced a hit film, Fruitvale Station. And that runs chills up and down our spine because for people who maybe live in New York, they have to look up Fruitvale Station. Where is Fruitvale Station? But for those of us who live in Oakland, we know Fruitvale Station very well. And some of us still, when we, we step on that, that BART train at Fruitvale Station, think of Oscar Grant's last day. Since she is now the CEO of the organization that we'll be discussing today, the Oscar Grant Foundation. It's a 501c3 organization that helps at-risk youth, grieving families and students support and enrichment, education and hunger. The foundation also has its own AAU basketball team in honor of Oscar called the OG Ballas. Wanda hopes to also improve the social inequities caused by negative stereotyping in law enforcement. She's an international motivational speaker, established gospel manager, and makes monthly appearances around the world, impacting hearts in similar struggles. A dynamic, well-spoken activist. She has made guest appearances on nationally syndicated television programs, at respected universities, and at public forums. She continues to bring attention to injustices that remain prevalent in law enforcement and the criminal justice system. And she has graced us today with her presence. For the next 20 minutes, you will hear from Wanda Johnson, founder of the Oscar Grant foundation. Hi, Wanda. Hello. Thank you so much, uh, Carmen, for the invite. Um, I truly have um, enjoyed thus far, um, had an opportunity to meet Dee Johnson. Um, she actually supported us and came uh, with backpacks for um, Oscar Grant Day, which was the Oakland declared that. So every 27th of February uh, has been declared as Oscar Grant Day on his birthday. And so I am just honored to be here. Uh, thank you, Carmen, for um, all that you have done to support the foundation um, and to bring forth assistance to help us even further our journey. Um, when I was asked to uh, be a part of the 
event on today and to even speak, I, I looked at the title and I thought about journey. I thought about how, you know, uh, before 2009, I had already thought I had mapped out my journey in life. I, I thought that I would retire from UPS. I, I thought that I would continue the ministry that God had given me, um, realizing and expecting uh, what he had spoke to me concerning my son was going to come to pass in a, a way that I thought it would come to pass. So when I think about journey, I think about um, an act or what the word journey means, traveling from one place to another. So I thought that I would travel on my UPS journey and my ministerial journey and be able to just impact lives that way. Um, being a uh, supervisor at UPS and manager, um, helping the staff to help them succeed in their goals that they had planned for their lives. And when 2008 came, um, my birthday is December 31st. I had spent that day. My son called me that morning and I was cooking gumbo and I had asked him to bring a few crabs. And we had spent that day together along with his uh, fiance and their daughter. And I thought it was just an an ordinary day that we would be spending my birthday together. We would have cake and ice cream. And he, you know, said that he wanted to go to uh, San Francisco uh, and they were going to watch the fireworks. And, you know, he was over 18, over 21. And so I said, okay, since you're driving, if you drink, don't drink and drive, take the BART. I thought it was, you know, a great way for him to go to San Francisco, uh, come back home, you know, not have to worry about getting in accidents, not have to worry about getting any tickets. And my journey shifted on that day uh, when I received the phone call that he had been shot. Uh, not knowing where he had been shot, not knowing who had shot him, but just that he had been shot and where I needed to go. And on that way, and on the way to pick up his fiance from the BART station um, and then to Highland Hospital, it was a journey. It, it first seemed like we would never reach that destination to the hospital. And finally, when we reached the destination to the hospital, uh, the social worker came out and she said, I want to tell you that his condition is very serious. And I want to tell you that um, the doctors are doing everything they can to save him. And so I went into the chapel, I found myself going into the chapel during that time and I began to pray. Um, I made several phone calls to uh, different people and some answered and some didn't. And I uh, prayed with those that came to the hospital, his friends, I told them to quiet down because they were crying and loud and just not understanding what was going on. And so we prayed there. And I had an opportunity to go into the room where they was working on my son and I held his hand and I, you know, prayed with him. And they asked me to go out of the room for a few minutes. And so I went out of the room and then they called me back into the room where Oscar had been shot um, in his lungs. Uh, one of his lungs was blew out and the other one had a hole in it and other parts of his body, internal organs had uh, been fractured or hit from the fra fragments of the bullets. And so he was bleeding internally uh, everywhere. And so when they would try to stop the bleeding in one place, bleeding would occur in other places. And so uh, 
they tried to do whatever they could to save him. And eventually he uh, passed. And I want to tell you that never did I expect to be on a journey where I would have to bury my son. I would hope and believe that my children would bury me. And because I ended up having to bury my son, my journey at that time that I had thought uh, the Lord had showed me concerning my son, which was that my son would go through some things in life, but that we would be in ministry together. And here I thought the ministry that we would be in ministry together, that we would be in churches and we would be sharing the gospel together and he would be ministering and I would be ministering, but that we would be doing that together as a team. Uh, I would be able to hold him and hug him and encourage him that way. And when Oscar died, I, you know, began to have this powwow with the Lord and said, Lord, you said that we would be in ministry together. And the Lord spoke to me to look around. And when I looked around, I began to see faces that I had not seen before. It was all kind of faces, all different nationalities, never seen these faces before. And the Lord reminded me in that moment that we are in ministry together. The, the ministry to help others to be able to go through this life and know that there is help. And so when I began to think about that and I began to look at that, that all the faces that I had and I'm, I'm meeting were due to because of what happened with Oscar and due to the foundation starting. And during that time, I, my brother was such an advocate and all my family and community was such an advocate to have seen such an injustice and to begin to pray for us, um, encourage us and support us and even come with us as we had to go to court in LA. And while we were in LA, we went through the proceedings and the officer was uh, charged with uh, involuntary men slaughter and a gun enhancement charge. But because the judge uh, said he gave the jury the wrong instructions, uh, he threw out the gun enhancement charge with the jury had found the officer convicted of. And then he gave the uh, officer 11 months in the county jail. He gave him good behavior for this, good behavior for being an officer, good behavior for uh, being on the force, good behavior. But he gave him so many uh, good behaviors that he only ended up with 11 months in a county jail. And from that, we, my family and I went to several meetings and um, we spoke with a young lady who was in LA and we began to talk about starting the Oscar Grant Foundation. And from that, the Oscar Grant was found, the Oscar Grant Foundation was founded. And through that, my brother uh, and I, he would really host and run it at that time because I was still in a place of feeling if I hadn't told my son to take Bart, maybe he still would be here. You know. Sometimes there's things that transpire in our life where uh, the enemy tries to put guilt upon us and to make it seem like as if it's your fault for the very thing occurring. And so I had to go through that process of really understanding that it was not my fault that I told my son to take part, but it was in fact the right thing to do. And my mother was one who kind of pushed me and helped me with that process. And she began to say to me, who's the God you believe in? Who's the God you serve? And if you trust in the Lord, 
God is able to do anything to heal you everywhere that you hurt. And so the the hurt uh, started to uh, decrease in a fire of not wanting to see families go through with what we went through as a family begin to rise. And from the foundation, we started as the Oscar Grant Foundation, we, we started to want to bridge that gap between uh, policing and community. Because as you look, Oscar's uh, case was recorded by seven different videos, but you can imagine how many cases have occurred that didn't have a video, that was not seen, was deemed as uh, the person who was killed as, it's, as if it was their fault. And so we wanted to begin to shed light by offering our youth alternative ways and letting our society know that our youth can excel in everything that they do. And so when I think about the journey that our family, that the Oscar Grant Foundation has been on, I think about the journey, not just my journey, but if we look at Oakland and the Bay Area as a whole, the journey that our society has been on has been a journey where we're seeing an increase of killing not just at the hands of both police, but at the hands of community, uh, young men killing young men. And so the foundation began to look at that. We began to talk about the mental health of our young men and young women in our communities. We don't talk about often, uh, PTSD was used basically for military. But when we really look at PTSD, and we look at our youth today, and I look at the young men and women who was on the platform with my son when he was killed and shot, I look at their lives and I saw the struggles, the pain, the anger, the self-medication. I saw all of that that they tried to cover themselves with to deal with what they saw when my son's life was taken. And so we began to talk as a foundation saying that we have to do something. We have to begin to educate our community that mental health is real, that our young men and our young women and even our adults are not getting the treatment. They're not getting the services that they need. And so one of the ways that we decided that we wanted to try to provide services for our youth is to offer, to begin to offer them school supplies um, on a small scale that could help them not have to worry about how they're going to uh, write out the lesson, how they're going to color in a coloring book. And so we began to try to provide that for them. And we knew we needed to do more because uh, we know that the statistics show that our youth in the third and fourth grade, it is determined if they're going to be incarcerated, right? And so we knew that we had to provide something else to let them know that we're here to support them. And so we have the tutoring program that uh, we work with currently, and we have been um, working in the Hayward uh, and Oakland area for those students that need tutoring. And then, you know, as our Statistics show uh, African American and brown young men and women often drop out of school. And so we want to encourage them that they can uh, make it, that they can be what God created them to be, that God has gifted them. And no one can complete that gift but them, what God placed in them. And so we begin to offer scholarships for 
those that are graduating. And we're so glad and proud to say that in offering the scholarships, we get to follow those uh, young adults throughout their scholarship journey in school. And, you know, we have one young adult who we've been following and I was in New York um, last week and I got to visit him. He's now at Columbia Law School. And um, we are so glad that, you know, we watched him 13 years ago, you know, grow up and graduate, follow him in high school, follow him in junior college and college, and now Columbia Law School. And, you know, we're looking forward to him graduating um, from Columbia Law School as an attorney. And so I, I, I say this to say that our journey in life, when my, when my journey took a twist, I never thought that I would found a, be a founder or be a CEO of a foundation. I never thought that we, I would see the foundation be able to touch and help lives because I had my own journey scoped out. You know, many of us write goals and, you know, we sometimes our goal isn't in line with the journey that we have. But I'm grateful to say that even when the children of Israel was on their three day journey, that God was over their journey and the foundation has been birthed through much prayer. And God has been with the foundation, leading us and directing us. And with the vision that he has given unto us, Carmen, I want to say to you that the provision that God has given unto the foundation has not ran out. Uh, funds come from people that we don't even know, that we don't even think that we're going to come from. But God has allowed the foundation to be able to be blessed to help others. And so we are so grateful that we can just tap into just a portion of youth to help them, to just say to them that God created you for a purpose and you can be whatever you desire to be. If you stay focused on that plan, if you continue to reach the goal that has been set for you, if you continue to understand that the race that all of us are on, that is not given to the swift. There's days when many of us in foundations wanna just throw in the towel. But if we know and we trust God, Proverbs 3, uh, 6 and 7, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. And, you know, I want to close with just one thing, uh, Carmen. I, I thought about a story in the Bible that was given to me after Oscar was killed. And that story was a lady named Rizba. Rizba had two sons and her sons was killed by the Gibeonites because of something Saul had done. And they hung her sons. And Rizba, she fought off the animals and she fought off the birds and she fought off everything that would try to touch her sons while they was being hung on that on those trees. Mm. And she did that for a space of six months. She kept covering them. She kept protecting them. Preach it. So I, I say to us today that in what God has given us and in what God had given me, he has given me to fight off those things that the enemy tried to bring against us, tries to bring against your foundations, begin to fight them off and begin to know that everything that God promised you, God is faithful to bring it to pass. Yeah. It may not be 
according to our timing, but it will happen according to his timing. And all we got to do is keep believing. All we got to do is keep praising. All we got to do is keep trusting. And when I heard Michelle's testimony on today, I began to rejoice in the Lord. I began to thank the Lord because we have to bless God and thank God in others' joys. When others are joyful, when they rejoice, we have to rejoice with them. And so, Carmen, I just began to rejoice with the Lord when I heard Sister Michelle's testimony, Sister D's testimony. And I always remember what the scripture says in Psalms 34, the 19th verse says, there are many afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. And so because God delivers us out of them all, when we're going through with trying to say we're not going to do our foundations anymore, or even when we want to begin a foundation and we don't think we're equipped, if God before you, it doesn't matter who's against you. All we have to do is know that our weapon of warfare is our praise, and we have to understand what Psalms 34 1 says, where it says that I will, no matter what my circumstance, Carmen, no matter the loss of my child, but I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. Hey. And I, I, I thank God for that because my soul do magnify the Lord because he has done great things for me. Amen. And so I end with Habakkuk 2 2, whatever the vision is, write the vision make it plain <laughs> and those who hear the vision guess what they're going to run with it and you will be successful in all that god has called you to do carmen i thank you for the opportunity and so i encourage everyone the journey that you're on don't look back but be like the runner keep pressing forward because the race that you're on is not given to the swift, nor to the strong, but to the one that endures to the end. And guess what, people on this line? We are an enduring people, and God definitely has a plan for each one of our lives. And Amen. I'd like to say God bless you and thank oh, you. Amen. Uh, why you want to do that to me, uh, Sister Wanda? Because you know I got to say some more stuff. And, 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 <laughs> and now I'm going to get up and shout for everybody. No, that was amazing. Thank you so much. You are a blessing. Ooh, amazing. Um, and none of us can talk right now. I mean, we're, just, we're just sitting here weak from what you have said. And I hope those of you who are on the line are encouraged. And I hope that you know that that message about pressing forward that's for you. That's for all of you. We have 52 people on the line. That's for all of you. And we thank you. And we're so grateful. Globe Trotter, Sister Wanda, you can imagine what our conversations have been like. <laughs> They're sermons. Thank but, you. Thank but you. Thank you so, so much. Oh, thank, thank you so you. much. Hallelujah. Praise. Hallelujah. Thank you. Bless and that's heart. why it's called a model built on faith. And David was right. All right. We have more. We have more. So next. Ooh, amen. <laughs> Everybody's weak. We're, we're not going to go to Q&A right now um, because we're going to press on. And, and the next thing is that we have a very brief giveaway because we want to appreciate all of you. So I'm going to ask Sister Ebony, if she would give away this money for us. Where are you, Sister Ebony? <laughs> hey. <laughs> so, oh, there we go. There we go. <laughs> we want to see you. We want to see you. Can you see me? Nope. You can't. Oh, my video is showing. Gonna, gonna bring stop. her up. 
Bring her up, Sister Shot. Can you see me? I there see we you. We see you. Okay. <laughs> Hi, okay. everyone. So first, I want to give appreciation to two people that have attended five out of six workshops thus far. What is the last one, huh? So we have Betty Blackmore Gee and also Stephen, you go, I'm gonna mess up your last name, sorry. Um, Stephen, Stephen, are you here? Is he still on? Is Stephen still on? Do you see him? Shy, do you see Stephen? I think he left. Oh, or he maybe, left. He oh, left oh well, no, I'll touch. I have there. his number, so I'll... he actually is here. Sorry. Oh, he is here. Yeah, yeah. Stephen and Betty. Maybe stepped away, but I see him. Okay, yeah, I know that Stephen's still here. Okay. So... Well, thank you two for attending five out of six of our workshops, and we look forward to seeing you next year as well. And next, I have two trivia questions. The first one, and this is for anybody. Anybody, anybody so anyone who can, wants to get a yeah. prize. So can y'all help me look at the chat? You can either raise your hand first, whoever, or you can type in the chat. So it's two. The first one, in what city was the popsicle invented? Come on now. Come on, come on. Think about it. <laughs> Not New Orleans. <laughs> No. A little closer. Nope. Nope. No, Angela. Good try. Anyone else? We have somebody. Oakland. Thank you, Patricia. <laughs> now, Rania, raise her hand. Rania, next time, oh. just put it in the chat. There's another question coming up. Um, so. 11 year old Frank Epperson left his drink out in the cold and woke up to find a treat frozen to the staring stick. That's how we got the popsicle and it was invented in Oakland. Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> Somebody needs to be, create some Oakland pops and sell those around the world because okay. that's where the popsicle was created. Okay, what's the next question? Next one. The, who was the first woman to fly solo from Hawaii to Oakland in 1935? I wasn't born yet, so I don't know. <laughs> and, yep, Bernice. Yep, Bernice, thank you. You're welcome, dear heart. <laughs> All right. That is it. For your air heart. Okay, yeah. so, so we have... Thank you. And this is just in appreciation to all of you who have supported a model built on faith. We're going to move forward now. Congratulations, winners. And thank you for those who have joined us for five out of six sessions. And now I'd like to introduce for the next five minutes, we have, we have about, no, we have about six minutes, Kevin Hill. Kevin, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, what's coming up with the, um, the voter guide? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. First of all, thank you. Uh, hopefully, Carmen, I don't take too much time, but um, I'm just uh, blessed to be uh, in, in uh, community with all y'all, and uh, I'm very blessed to be in this space this morning. Um, so uh, my name is Kevin Hill. Uh, I um, have an organization called Ben Organizing. We do interorganizational uh, research and program development. And one of the big projects that we focus on is called the Black Lives Voter Guide. So as you all know, we have an important election coming up very soon. Election day is Tuesday, November 8th. And uh, on Monday, October 10th is when vote by mail um, uh, ballots will be eligible. So pretty quickly, we'll be eligible to start voting. And a couple of years ago, I founded the Black Lives Voter Guide. This will be the second time we've done it. And the reason why I did is because uh, I've always been a voter. Uh, I've always been diligent you know, about voting ever since I was eligible. Um, and 
the reality is, even though I was diligent about voting, I wasn't always very well informed about our local elections, things that really impact our day to day lives, our families, our community, things like school board races, DA races, um, um, city council, mayor, all of those things that people tend to not be very well informed about unless you're an in, a political insider or a political junkie. So I started looking around for voter guides. There's lots and lots of voter guides that exist. Um, and there's even progressive voter guides that exist. But what I found is there are no voter guides that are uplifting black voices in particular. So I, start, I started organizing with uh, the leaders of black led nonprofits. Oh, okay. Because the idea is that yeah. those who are closest to the problems are also closest to the solutions that we need for our community. So I talked to the leaders of the uh, of black led nonprofits and get their point of view about our elections, our school board, our, our uh, city council, our mayor race, our DA, all of those things that are local to Oakland and also that are um, specific to Alameda County and all the way up to the state level propositions. And when there is a consensus opinion among that community of leaders, then we publish an endorsement in the voter guide uh, for that particular race. And the idea is that this voter guide is, is an education tool for new voters, for black voters, for allied voters to use when they um, step into the booth or fill out their at-home ballot when uh, they want to support black lives. Um, they can be, the ads can be confusing. Uh, a lot of the messaging that's out there can be confusing, but this is a way to give y'all uh, an opportunity to hear what people are saying. Uh, the leaders in our community are saying about our local elections uh, from, a, from voices that you can trust and uh, you can be assured have black folks centered in the conversation around uh, our elections. I'll put the, so <clears throat> where we are right now is in the very final uh, stage of the research, literally the next day or two at the very most, I'm collecting responses and uh, we have over 20 respondents already. So imagine if you could be in the beauty salon or the barbershop and you heard the leaders of black nonprofits, 20 of them sitting around chopping it up about our local elections. That's the experience that you get in this voter guide. You hear where there's a consensus in the room. I also give comments about what people are saying about certain candidates or certain measures or propositions and whatnot. And so that's what you get in this voter guide. It's a real, um, you know, just a, a voter centric way to really get a sense for how you can use your vote because it's great to tell people to register to vote. It's great to tell people to go vote, but if we don't give people the information to know how to vote, then we can't build power. So this is an opportunity for all of us to be a lot more informed when it comes time to casting our votes. I'll put the, um, the link in the website. <clears throat> the, the 2020 version is still up, but by the time uh, it, uh, you get your mail-in ballot, the new version will be up. That's what we'll be working on over the next week and a half. So um, you can get a sense for what it looks like and, and, and how to navigate it, but the very front page uh, shows exactly um, how it'll be set up. I'm happy to take any questions if we have time. Uh, we, uh, we've, we've run out of time, um, but you're going to be putting your link in That's the right. chat. Yes. And your website as well. Uh, sure, yeah, I can do that. Uh -huh. Okay, and uh, we see that Fred Fred has arrived, and he says thank you for your work, Kevin. And um, and so we're going to we'd love to hear some Q and A from Kevin, but we have we have very little time. We have one minute before Fred has to come on, and then afterwards he has another meeting. So thank you so much, Kevin for the work that you do, for everything that you do. And we are, it's, as Ann Carey says, it's very essential work. So also if you, we see any, any funders online who are joining us today, we want you to look at that link as well. 
and uh, look at uh, www.blacklivesvoterguide.org. And also um, the acabenorganizing.com organization. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. We're in partnership together. I appreciate y'all. You too. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Franklin, who will who will interview uh, Fred Blackwell. Dr. David Franklin is a nonprofit strategist. Many of you have heard uh, a lot of his, uh, several of his presentations that he's given this year, and we are delighted to have him as, as part of our team. Dr. Franklin is a nonprofit strategist who has founded, built, and accelerated growth for nonprofit organizations over the past 15 years. His work has encompassed foundations, schools, relief organizations, and faith-based organizations. With an intense belief that organizational culture drives outcomes, Dr. Franklin has focused his efforts on helping organizations create and improve systems that support a strong organizational culture. In addition to his work as a consultant, Dr. Franklin is the lead pastor of Miracle City Church. Miracle City is a thriving congregation in Southwest Baltimore with a focus on community development. And so I am delighted to introduce my friend, Dr. David Franklin, who will interview Fred Blackwell. And we're gonna hear what the San Francisco Foundation uh, is working on right now and what uh, its CEO, Fred Blackwell, has to tell us about the future of our work with them. Dr. Franklin? Very good, very good, good morning. I think it's still morning uh, uh, for, for folks. Um, and uh, Fred, it's really great to have you um, I'll give you I'll give everybody a second to for them to to spotlight you. Uh, but it's a, it's an honor to be able to conduct this interview. It's an honor to have you today. We know that you're not just busy, but you are exceedingly busy. Uh, so so uh, it, it's really an honor. And I, I thought maybe we could start at a real high level. We're here in large part because, the San Francisco Foundation continues to commit itself to the face work. And so I thought we could just start at a high level. Why do you think the face work is still so important uh, to the extent that uh, uh, San Francisco Foundation continues uh, to invest to ensure that it thrives? Yeah, thank you, uh, David. It's a pleasure to be with everybody. And it's always a pleasure for me to uh, be involved in a occur event. Um, you know, I, as uh, Sandra knows, I kind of uh, grew up in Okur, uh, right. introduced to it when I was a very young person, when my uncle David was running it. And right. Carmen, it's always good to, to see you and really glad to see you back uh, in this uh, in this role. Uh, so just wanted to acknowledge that up front. And David, I feel like I've known you since you were probably a teenager as well. Uh, so it's really great to see your leadership evolve and to be uh, on a, a panel with you. Um, you know, I was around at the San Francisco Foundation when the face work got started. It was then an initiative and, uh, you know, it was really about acknowledging the really important role that faith-based institutions play in community development, community service, and community transformation. Uh, and at the time, uh, it was a, a response to not only uh, that fact and the role that faith-based institutions play, uh, but the lack of support from philanthropy for them to play that role. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, that was the uh, the reason why we got it off the ground here at the San Francisco Foundation. And unfortunately, uh, a couple of decades later, uh, not much has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, not much has changed in terms of how important faith-based institutions are. Uh, in the work that we uh, are engaged in collectively together. And also not that much has changed in terms of philanthropy support uh, for that work. So uh, for that reason, we can continue to think that this work is important. And more specifically, the work that Okura is doing with the faith-based community is really important because uh, 
you know, we we believe pretty strongly at the San Francisco Foundation that, um, you know, capacity to do this work uh, is important and investing in the capacity of folks to do this work uh, is important. And so, you know, the the role that Occur has, has played in Oakland for decades now in terms of providing technical support and capacity building support to nonprofit organizations uh, is equally as important for faith-based groups. And so, you know, that's a long-winded way to say uh, we're continued to be committed to the work because you were committed to the work. Uh, and we also um, continue to be committed to the work because we it is our hope to get um, more folks like us uh, in partnership with you. Man, that's incredible. And it really aligns in many ways with the conversation we've been having. You know, the title for today is The Journey to the Vision. And really, much of what we've talked about is about clarifying the vision over time, right? And your commitment, not only to the faith community, but other communities. I'm sure there's been clarifying a vision and how you support over those years. So I wonder, you know, if you can share with us maybe a moment when you have gained clarity or on your personal or organizational vision and kind of what was the journey to gaining that clarity? Uh, because sometimes it's not just about uh, receiving a vision, but sometimes it's the, the journey along the way that helps to clarify the vision. So I wonder if you can just share a moment, um, either personal or professional, uh, about clarifying vi how vision has been clarified for you. Man, that is a great uh, question, David. And I, you know, there have been so many of those moments for me uh, when um, it's been made clear uh, what the work should be and how we should approach the work. So I will focus in on uh, a couple of the most recent. Um, you know, I uh, now I was talking to my mom recently uh, about uh, the work that we are engaged in, and you know. Uh, those of you who know me know that I've been very influenced by my family and their work in this regard. Uh, and one of the things that she talked about uh, was how she, when she came of age uh, in this work, uh, and she came of age in this work uh, kind of during the transition for Black people, kind of from the civil rights movement to the Black power movement. Mm. Um, and uh, you know, she went as far as to send me to the school that was founded and run by the Black Panther Party. She was so uh, deeply involved in that work. Uh, and one of the things that struck me about what she described, both in terms of the civil rights movement and the Black power movement, was the ability of a young person during that time to join something. To join something and to be a part of a group of people who were fighting. Uh, for something. Uh, and I, I have to admit, when I was um, talking to my mom about that, uh, it made me realize that I kind of came of age in this work um, at a time when there wasn't that much to join. Mm -hmm. um, and the implication of that for me has been, you know, I spent a career fighting for the same kinds of things that my family members fought for before me but doing it in a different way. Because there was not much to join, uh, I like to say that I became like super professional uh, in uh, the way that I approached the work. So uh, really fine tuning memo writing skills, uh, the ability to do real nice PowerPoints with the right amount of white space and the right number of bullet points. Um, you know, really try to paint a compelling picture through data of why this work is important and why people should care um, about it. And um, in the summer of 2020, young people who were fed up and basically saying that enough was enough, um, went to the streets uh, and demanded change. Uh, and that was an important moment for me because it was a moment that made me remember that the, the memos are important, the PowerPoints are important, the data are important, um, but they have to be combined with movement, with organizing, with emotion and anger uh, in order for the, the needle really to be moved. So the summer of 2020 was a reminder for me um, that we cannot 
professionalize ourselves to change. Um, and that we have to combine um, those professional skills and techniques that we've done so well honing with the anger, the frustration, and the emotion that comes from the feeling that enough is enough. Uh, and so th that was really an, an important moment for me and a clarifying moment around how is the San Francisco Foundation, we need to be investing in organizing, advocacy, movement work, policy work, uh, in addition to programs and services and things like that. So that, that was a real important moment. And I think that I'm in another moment right now, David. Uh, and the reason for that is because it is big, it's become really clear to me uh, that that, that um, moment that we were in, uh, in the summer of 2020, uh, is in the rearview mirror for a lot of people. Uh, and that people are, all these commitments and proclamations and uh, conversations that people were having uh, a couple of years ago uh, are now feeling um, distant and that folks have forgotten um, the kinds of conversations that we need to be having and the work that we need to be doing when it comes to race and justice. So I feel like I'm also in a movement now or in a moment now of clarity uh, about the fact that we cannot let people backpedal. Uh, we cannot let people um, back away from, nor can we um, just stand by and experience the backlash uh, that is occurring right now because people are uncomfortable talking about race. Man, I, I feel like this just uh, turned into uh, <laughs> a workshop where we need to have a session just on um, preventing that 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 uh, that retraction of support, right? And that that uh, that lukewarm. Uh, ness from happening, a, mm -hmm. as it were. Um, and so I guess that that kind of begs another question, at least in the context of our conversation today is, so where, are the, where do you believe are still those opportunities for collaboration, for achieving the vision that some folks may even want to kind of, you know, put on the back burner? Uh, you know, a lot of the talk today has been around working together in partnerships and building coalitions and that kind of thing. What, what's the role for that to even pre pre prevent some of this uh, retraction of support? Yeah. Um, David, one of the, um, well, first of all, all those things that you all are talking about are right on point. Um, and I, uh, I, uh, agree uh, with that. And I think one of the things that we have to guard against is the notion that one community's gain has to be another community's setback. Um, and we have to get to a place where we're working with one another in not just a transactional way, and I don't mean that to be, you know, derogatory, but I mean, a, a lot of what uh, collaboration and coalition building looks like is, you know, I show up to your meeting because you showed up to mine, uh, or uh, I'll, uh, I'll retweet something that you say because I, you know, I think it, uh, um, it is, a, is a hot topic or a hot take. Um, we've got to get to a more transfer level of solidarity and cooperation and, and coalition building um, where we really recognize that what looks like somebody else's problem today is going to be our problem tomorrow. Um, where Black, Brown, Asian communities are working um, together in solidarity and not allowed to uh, let wedge issues um, enter into the conversation that uh, pit one racial or ethnic group against another. Um, we've got to be comfortable um, with centering the Black and Indigenous experience because it is um, defining for other people's oppression as well. Um, you know, recognizing that, um, you know, a lot of what we are still dealing with is the um, originates from the pursuit of 
free land that resulted in genocide and the pursuit of free labor, which resulted in bondage and slavery. Um, and that those defining original sins still impact how um, non-Black, non-Indigenous people experience this country. All those kinds of things, I think, are things that we have to uh, come to terms with, um, which all involves, David, uh, all of us getting a little bit more uh, comfortable with the uncomfortable conversations that have to be had with, with regard to all this stuff. You know, I've been in too many meetings where, um, you know, a disagreement around an issue like this uh, occurs and that's the end of the meeting. Um, when really that should be the beginning of the meeting. Uh, and so all that stuff I think is gonna be important in terms of how we approach the work and how we get to, like I said, a place where, um, you know, one community's gained it and views another community set back and we are um, getting beyond this zero sum thinking that leads us nowhere. That's great. I'm gonna ask you this last question, but before I do, I wanna go on record as saying that uh, Fred Blackwell needs to author a book uh, and go on a speaking tour around these issues uh, so that, you know, we can have more voices sensitizing, uh, you know, our community and the broader community uh, to these very conversations. So, I'm pre-ordering that book. Exactly. <laughs> we we got 52 pre -or 50 pre-orders right now, Fred. <laughs> Um, but but here's here's the last question. So with all of this, you know, and again, you you can take this however you uh, in whatever direction you choose. But where's your where's your hope? What do you what 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 do you leave with these all of the nonprofit leaders who are on the on the uh, session right now? You know, dealing with uh, these challenges as it relates to collaboration, trying to address real issues, homelessness, crime, education, etc. You know, and to your point that you know, some of these issues have endured over the years and can begin to weary on the soul. So what, what is your, you know, what hope do you have regarding addressing these challenges that, that you can leave, uh, leave our attendees with today? Yeah, you know, um, here, here's the deal. Um, and, you know, it's inspirational for me, but I don't know if it's gonna be inspirational for everybody else, David, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Um, okay. You know, people are doing a whole lot of hand wringing nowadays around um, our economy and our democracy. Um, and you know, I, I believe firmly that we are not going to realize a thriving democracy or a robust economy without racial equity. So what motivates me uh, every day and what uh, I have hope about uh, is that enough of us understand that to the degree that we're willing to fight for it. Hmm. Um, so really, I mean, you know, I, I can say more, but I think that's probably saying enough. <laughs> well, thank you for your time. Like we said, like I said, to start, uh, we know that you are, are busy. Um, and so and not just busy, but exceedingly busy. And you have definitely um, elevated our thinking uh, today. Yeah. and in the short time that we've had. So blessings on the work that you continue to do. Well, thank you so much. And I, you know, I said it in the chat, but Kevin, I really want to thank you for the work that you're doing, because I think what you are doing is, is an example of what I talked about in terms of, you know, the kind of transformative solidarity that we need. Uh, and that uh, when people understand uh, that going to the polls is important, but what they do when they get there is important. Uh, and sometimes what looks like uh, voting in somebody else's self-interest, like having a Black Lives Matter or a Black Lives Count thing, uh, feels like somebody else's uh, issue. That when, when people understand that they are voting in a way that supports the advancement of Black people, that they benefit themselves, whether or not they are Black, I think is a very important body of work. So I want to thank you again, man. I, it's good stuff. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fred. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you. So for all grateful you. that you were able to carve out some time to be with us today. We are we are all grateful. Great to see y'all. Good to see you too. Thank you. Okay. Well, well, we have someone now. First of all, 
I want to get a commitment from all of you to not leave until you have responded to the poll. Um, and so we have, uh, if you could just give us like five more minutes. First of all, I don't know where she just disappeared to, but I'd like to bring up Sandra Alexander. Well, let's do the poll first. And it'll take two minutes. And you all know how to do this. Are there any instructions, Ebony, to do this poll? No, just answer the questions. I believe they're all multiple choice. Yep. Okay. Show yeah, they're all multiple. Oh, sorry. Show me disagree. Shai, do you have any instructions? Um, no. Okay. This is, oh, this is this is not the the right one, Ebony. It's the one about the um, future workshops. That is the only poll that popped up. Mm. Okay, so that. while you two are are, are kind of <laughs> working that out, let's. I want to hear from Sandra. Sandra Alexander, who and she just where did she go? I'm here. I'm here, Carmen. I'm okay, right here. I'm let's, here. Let's uh shy. Can you bring up Sandra, please? Yes, give me just one second. <laughs> there she is. Give me a second. Sorry, I'm grabbing her. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce the executive director of OCUR. Mm -hmm. And she is a woman of God. She is a powerful woman, a powerful person. And I am so grateful for her. We're all grateful for her because she has stepped in so many times in the history of this organization. She's been with this organization for years and years and years. And many times I have watched Sandra. Uh, David was a dreamer, a thinker. And I've often said that he was like a kite in a high wind, but somebody has to be standing on the ground holding the string, right? Well, that would be Sandra. And so she doesn't like attention. She doesn't like the spotlight. That's why I'm getting so much joy for putting her in the spotlight right now. <laughs> but she comes, she's, she's, her family is dynamic. David Franklin is her nephew. Come on. And, and, and she really is the backbone of this organization. And so, Sandra, can you please just give us a couple words, just a couple? Yes, Carmen loves putting me on the spot, as you all well know. And I'm going to be very honest. I felt like we had church today. So I'm still here in my glory, enjoying all of the speakers, all of the amazing women that were able to tell us their story and take us on their journey. And at this point, all I can do is really just say thank you. Um, I want to thank Fred and the San Francisco Foundation. As he said, uh, when he was a young kid, he would come in the office with his uncle and to look at him and the amazing things that he's doing now uh, just warms my heart. Um, Michelle, I don't know what we would do without her over the years. She has supported us even during the time when she was uh, home taking care of two sick people. Uh, she was still very much supporting us. She and Saran, her assistant, um, and Carmen. Uh, what can I say about you? You know, we, Carmen and I had a bit of a hi hiatus. Uh, we, we left O'Kerr. <laughs> for a short time together. And um, we were at, well, I was asked to return first. And I told Carmen so much of that depended on uh, her coming back and helping out. And she graciously accepted. And, and I feel like, I don't know about those of you that are in attendance, but I feel like this was a stellar year. I feel like it was one of the best years we've had. I feel like the workshops that were put together in, in a very short time, have been just amazing and, and impactful. And, um, you know, I want to thank our staff. Couldn't have done it without Shai, Simone, Ebony, Denise, and Dr. David Franklin, who has certainly pitched in uh, lately to really take us to a whole nother level. Uh, hopefully you'll be seeing and hearing more from him as uh, time goes on. 
And um, then I want to thank all of you for coming and attending and sharing. Uh, we wouldn't have these if we didn't have you. So thank you. Big thank you to all of you. Uh, I love you. I look forward to seeing you next year. And I do hope that uh, even though we're finished uh, early, a little bit early this year, uh, it's just the end of September, but we're still at the office. We're available if you have questions, concerns, um, if you want to talk about uh, what you'd like to see next year and didn't finish get to fill out the poll. I guess the poll's going to be The poll's going to come up next. Okay. Uh, the um, poll, um, yeah. If you have more that you want to add to that, please feel free to call the office. And thank you.